When I was in Phoenix recently, I heard the testimony of a young university student who had converted from atheism to Christianity. And he indicated in his testimony that he had been meeting weekly with a local pastor for several months. And that this particular pastor had challenged him to look at the world through new eyes. And this gentleman acknowledged that he had looked at the world with nearsightedness. And the pastor pushed him to see farther, to go beyond his ordinary focal point. What if God existed? But what would the world look like if he did? What would life look like? If God did exist, how do you think we should live? And this particular gentleman found that over time we attribute this to the Holy Spirit. He became more receptive to the idea that there is a God. And his perspective on the world vastly changed and enlarged so that it wasn't so nearsighted, it wasn't so myopic anymore. And he was well on his way to becoming a kingdom sage. Do you want to be a kingdom sage? Well, you say that all depends on what a sage is. But a sage, you see, is a Jedi. Do you want to be a kingdom Jedi? Well, you say, great to be a Jedi, it would be. <laughs> a kingdom sage is an individual who's wise about the kingdom. A kingdom sage is somebody who operates, not from a merely human perspective, but who operates from a divine perspective, a perspective that God himself has informed. I don't know if you know the name Johannes Kepler, but he was a 17th century German mathematician and astrologer who once wrote something that I've become very fond of. He said that we need to think God's thoughts after him. And that's what it is to be a kingdom sage, to think God's thoughts after him, to adopt God's perspective on things. And then we make a radical discovery. We see that what is so reasonable and so natural and so ordinary becomes, from God's perspective, quite absurd. And perhaps that absurdity is to be found in your life. That's the question that we need to investigate this morning. Jesus wants us to reach that point where we recognize that so much of how people live, so much of how we live, is in fact absurd. He wants us to be kingdom sages. Now there are two lessons in particular that are imparted in this passage, and both of them are going to help us get on the way to be kingdom sages, kingdom Jedis. The first lesson is that love is more than justice. Love is more than justice. And the second lesson is living is more than having. Love is more than justice, and living is more than having. And we're going to see three secondary points there. It includes giving, it includes dying, and it includes caring. Love is more than justice, and living is more than having because it includes giving, dying, and caring. Well, if we look at the context of this particular parable, we notice how at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus has been teaching about things of eternal significance, things of great importance. And then as somebody speaks out of the crowd and poses a question and says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, rabbis in those days would often make judgments about these kinds of matters. This particular individual's father has just passed away. It was the older brother's responsibility to divide the inheritance. He wasn't doing it. You know the saying, where there's a will, there's a family. 
Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And we get the impression that Jesus is not so impressed with this individual. He responds to him rather rudely. The rude response is apparent, not just in the English, but in the Greek. Man, who made me judge over you? Jesus is upset with this man. But why is he upset? Well, because his father has just died. And this man is preoccupied with stuff. Preoccupied with things. Jesus has been talking about matters of eternal significance. And this man is concerned with his earthly inheritance. He doesn't ask Jesus for an opinion. He doesn't want Jesus to tell him what he should do. In fact, he tells Jesus what he should do. You need to tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Sometimes when we're mistreated, we magnify the problem so that it's more important than everything and everyone else. And we need to learn to subordinate our case, which may be a just case. We need to learn to subordinate it to life itself and to preserve relationships as much as possible rather than damage them, rather than hinder them. Lesson number one, love is more than justice. Now, this is a lesson that we need to learn in relationships. It's a lesson we need to learn in marriages. If you're not married, it's a lesson we need to learn in friendships. Sometimes when my wife and I squabble about things and I make this vigorous case for why I'm right and I'm known to do that, muster all kinds of arguments. And my wife will say something like, you're winning the battle but you're losing the war. You're right, you're just, but are you loving? You're right, you're just, but are you damaging relationships? Love is more than justice. Jesus underscores this point with this parable. Parable of a rich man, he's rich, right from the very beginning. And he experiences as a farmer a surplus, a bumper crop. What's he going to do with a bumper crop? He's got an idea to tear down the barns that he has, and he'll build bigger barns to store the surplus crop. Now, Jesus, over the course of his ministry, told many stories about rogues and charlatans. He says nothing on the surface. Nothing negative about this man. This man is wise, he is frugal, he is responsible, he is the kind of person we would like to be. He makes preparations for the future. He doesn't just spend whatever he has. Farmers in some communities are known to be complainers. I lived for some time in Alberta, in a town that was surrounded by farming communities. And you know, farmers uh, often complain about things. I don't mean to pick on farmers. I suppose we all complain about things. But farmers, uh, after a bad year, will cry out to the government and sometimes uh, seek a bailout of some sort. And it seems, for those who aren't farmers, that farmers are always whining about something. Well, I had a young farmer in the congregation I pastored, and I posed this question to him. I said, what is it with the farmers that they're always complaining about their plight? And he said to me, the plight of the farmer is this, good years and mismanagement. So you have a good year, a surplus crop, you do very well, lots of income, and you buy all kinds of brand new equipment. The next year is a bad year, and you can't afford it. Good years and mismanagement. 
I want you to notice with me this morning that this farmer is a wise farmer. He can't be considered guilty of mismanagement. He creates these bigger barns to be greater storehouses for his surplus crop. He has the wisdom of Joseph. The wisdom of Joseph. He's the epitome of responsibility. And yet here's where we learn lesson number two. Living is more than having Living is more than having. This man is responsible, but he's extremely self-centered. And I want you to listen to verses 17 and 18 and see how often you hear the first person personal pronoun. What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and I will store all my grain and my goods. This guy's an egomaniac. Seemingly no concern for others. No mention of his employees. No mention of his children, his parents, anybody else. Wealthy people are tempted to become reclusive. That's one of the temptations that wealthy people face. Because if you're wealthy, you don't need people in your neighborhood. You can buy whatever help you need. This man has a very important decision to make about the future. He consults no one. He makes the decision entirely by himself. He doesn't think of others. Now, in conservative Protestant churches and Reformed churches, we're known to talk about the advantages of capitalism, a free enterprise and a free market. And, well, we could hardly tolerate hearing Bernie Sanders, right, talk about socialism and the distribution of wealth and these sorts of things. I want to assure you this morning that God does not intend for us to enjoy the wealth that we accumulate only for ourselves. He intends for us to distribute the wealth that we have accumulated. He envisions us to give to those who are in need. And the church father, Augustine, has got a great line about this parable. He says, the bellies of the poor make better storehouses than barns. The bellies of the poor make better storehouses than barns. Life is more than having. It includes at least giving. The rich man plans to retire early, verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. People call him a success. God calls him a fool, verse 20. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Well, there he is. He's in his early 50s. He's paid off his house. He's paid off the cottage. The retirement party has come and gone. He's standing on his patio with a Coors Light, savoring its great taste. And he says, I've done it. I have all that I need to live a wonderful life. Starts paging through vacation brochures to see where he's going to go, what he's going to do. And then he feels a sharp pain in his chest, and he dies. Living is more than having. It also includes dying. Living is more than having. It includes giving. But living is more than having because it includes dying. God calls him a fool. Now, fools in the Bible are distinguished not by their stupidity, but by their immorality. Think of Psalm 14, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. 
Now, in the ancient world, you found very few true atheists. Just about everybody believed in a god of some sort. But this person, and fools in the Bible are generally like this, lives as if there is no god. He's not a real atheist, he's a practical atheist. The rich man discovered that, in spite of all of his preparations, he had no control over his life. His life was alone from God, and God could demand repayment at any given moment. Now, I think that's something we need to reflect upon. Life is not a right. Life is a gift. I wonder what you'll think of this assessment. I sometimes object to the language of right to life, which, of course, is language that we use in terms of the campaign against abortion and the taking of unborn lives. But we don't have a right to life. We should talk instead about the value of life, the dignity of life. We have no right to life, not for 10 months, not for 50 months, not for 10 years, not for 50 years. Each day is a gift. Each day should be celebrated. And that's why Jesus has us pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us today our daily bread. We're not to worry about tomorrow. God could demand repayment of the loan of life tomorrow. We could die tomorrow. We can legitimately worry about today. Give us today our daily bread. Life is more than having. It includes dying, and those who spend their lives in pursuit of wealth end up with the poverty of death. Listen to what Robert Farrar Capon writes. We clutch at our lives rather than open our hands to our deaths. As long as we do that, the real life that comes only by resurrection remains permanently out of reach. We must be prepared. That is a lesson we learned here. But we must be prepared to die. And to be prepared to die, you have to recognize that God is in control. He is the master of your life. And your destiny is not in your hands, they're in his hands. But Jesus makes these wonderful promises. He promises us the resurrection of the body. He promises us eternal life. He promises us a new creation that we can inhabit. If earthly life is a gift, how much more of a gift is eternal life? And what is the price tag, do you think, for eternal life? Jesus gives us eternal life at the price of his own blood. He sacrificed himself so that we would not die but live and live forever. Can you see this? Do you believe this? If you prepared for the future but you haven't prepared for your death, you've made bad preparations. You've made a poor investment. Do you have a house? Do you own your house? Wonderful. The Bible wants you to think for a moment about who's going to get the house when you move on. A day will come when somebody else enjoys your house. All those nice renovations you made, somebody else will one day enjoy them. Everything changes hands rather rapidly. Think of the money in your pocket. The $5 bill. Where has that $5 bill all been? And where will that $5 bill go? You have it now, but pretty soon it will be in somebody else's hands. And dollar bills apparently wear down very quickly and then are taken out of circulation. They're constantly moving hands. This is the lament of Ecclesiastes 2, 18. I hated all my toil in which I toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise or a fool. Paul says to Timothy, we come into the world naked and we leave naked. We come with nothing, we leave with nothing. And I want to pose this question to you this morning. If someone were to take away all of your possessions, what would be left of you? 
would you still be defined or described as a success if everything were taken for, from you? Are you still left with a beautiful character? Saddam Hussein, you know, looked so impressive at the height of his reign, didn't he? These ornate palaces. And then towards the end, he was discovered in a hole in the ground with nothing left to admire. Don't invest in transient things. So do you understand what Jesus is saying to the questioner? He says, okay, suppose you, you win in the fight for your inheritance. Suppose you get exactly what was promised you. Then what? Where will this inheritance go when you die? Life is more than having. It includes giving. It includes dying. It includes caring. God owns all. He owns us. He owns all that we have, and we are stewards. And we must manage things on God's behalf. We are responsible to him. What do we do with the surpluses in life? Now, I don't know how many in our congregation actually enjoy surpluses, but maybe there are a few of us. What do we do with the surpluses? Some hide them. Some flaunt them. Some use them to purchase more and more. Some use them to upgrade and upgrade and upgrade. But we must care for the things God has given us for his glory and for the well-being of others. The questioner is desperate for an inheritance, but Jesus wants him to stop and think, shouldn't you be obsessed with something else? It's a little bit like a child. When you give a young child a gift, he's sometimes more enamored with the box than with the gift that comes in the box. And here, this particular man is more enamored with the gifts than with the giver. Shouldn't you, Jesus is saying, be enamored and captivated by the giver? <coughs> That's how you become a kingdom sage. You abandon the perspective that's myopic and nearsighted and selfish, and you envision the world as it is, created by God, supervised by God, from his myopic and nearsighted perspective, everything that the rich man did seemed right. And for a lot of people in our world, you'd have to say, this man behaved responsibly, reasonably, though in God's eyes it was absurd. To be a kingdom sage, you need to think God's thoughts after him. When you think God's thoughts after him, you recognize that love is more than justice. When you think God's thoughts after him, you recognize that living is more than having. It includes giving, it includes dying, it includes Jesus knew that death was the payment for sin, but he also understood that love is more than justice. And he said, I'll die for those people who justly deserve death, even though I'm innocent, I won't plead my rights. I'll die as an innocent person for those who are guilty. And on the basis of that death, I will offer them the gift of eternal life, the promise of resurrection, a new creation, free of sin, sickness, suffering, evil, that they can inhabit. You may be prepared for the future, the real question is, are you prepared to die? Jesus makes you a wonderful offer, extends an amazing gift. Receive the offer. 
receive the gift and trust yourself to him and become rich towards God. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you this morning for all of your gifts, not least the gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> the gift through which we are saved. Help us as we begin to receive this gift, as we begin to understand this gift, as we begin to enjoy this gift, to become givers and cheerful givers. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.